still belongs to the Honorable Prime Minister. Um, notwithstanding that, in the Prime Minister's delivery this morning, he would have said what my duties are. Um, first order of the day is, I think, we have to accept where we are as a country, what is the situation on the ground, um, and we need to arrest the current situation. We, the primary agency is the Royal St. Lucia Police Force, and they're charged with the responsibility of maintaining law and order. I want to assure you that I will be working very closely with the men and women of the Royal St. Lucia Police Force to deal with the immediate um, situation as we speak. We will be working very closely to, to ensure that we arrest the, the current situation on the ground. However, moving forward, crime is a multifaceted uh, a, crime is a very complex phenomenon, and we need to adopt a multifaceted approach. It is one that requires us looking at from the socialization of children, the schooling, um, what happens at the schools, and we see what is happening at the schools currently. Um, we need to look at it in a holistic manner, and the approach has to be one that encompasses and envelops all <coughs> the other components and not just what we see being reported on the media. So. It will, I, I, I will be working with all, with all the agencies, and I was happy that this morning Prime Minister ensured that he mentioned that we will work with everybody, including um, opposition parties, all agencies who have an interest in fighting crime, we will work with them. Um, the idea is not to alienate or um, sideline anybody. We understand that different persons may look at things from different perspectives. So moving forward, we will deal with the, the whole idea is to deal with what is currently existing, and then we look at how we can develop the holistic plan. Is the crime prevention uh, portfolio, is it a subdivision of national security, or is it a standalone industry? Does it cover with PS? Uh, what, what, what is it? Well, the Prime Minister said, it's a minister within the ministry, within the office of the Prime Minister um, for crime prevention. So it will be, I will be getting the assistance from the Prime Minister. I've, been guaranteed that I'll be getting assistance from the Prime Minister. Notwithstanding that, it will be a standalone ministry. Uh, Minister, congrats on your new position as Minister. But um, in reference to the, we talk of crime prevention, but we also talk a lot about social programs. You know, the government, the Prime Minister has put a lot of social programs, and the youth economy, there's a lot of different outlets. And you, you as a young man, like relation to the communities, how do you see you bringing the aligned youths to some of these programs? Because a lot of them don't make, not that they're not aware of it, but they don't, as if it doesn't attract them or they're not, or they're not interested or they don't participate. How can you see your position aligning the youths to more social programs in the communities, in the clubs, in the, you know, in the groups, to, to, to more of this, you know, this criminal yeah, um, to start off, I don't know if I quite agree with um, the program not attracting the youth because if you look at the statistics from the Youth Economy Agency, for instance, and the amount of applicants, notwithstanding the amount that we can actually absorb, you'd realize that sometimes some of these programs are even oversubscribed in terms of the amount of applicants that we get. So it speaks to us even um, building on more programs. Um, but there are also programs where I think we can do a little more sensitization and educational we can give we can do an educational component to it to ensure that um, <coughs> young people are or they, they, they move towards these programs but even before it gets to the stage where we speak about young people and the programs that are being offered we have to look at the parenting and the current situation that we have with parenting in St. Lucia and um, you don't lose our young people when they turn 15 and 16 some of them will lose them even before that and we need to really work towards trying to ensure that we keep them on the straight and narrow, even before it gets to the stage where we feel that they now gravitate towards a crime, um, a gang or a life of crime. So, um, But we have quite a bit of social programs, as you rightfully said, and the government continues to work with other groups, um, like you look at RISE, St. Lucia, you've got Raise Your Voice. We work with all the groups and all the agents, and that's why I said that the holistic program that we're going to develop is not going to um, sideline anybody. We're going to take we're going to look at it with various views, various perspectives, and see how we can develop something where everybody can benefit, all young people can benefit, because, I mean, the situation is not one that we can allow to continue as it is. But the government continues to work. We continue to do, put in the programs. Um, and I said, some of these programs, you look at the um, micro 
and small medium enterprise the, the grants you look at the amount of young people who've been able to benefit and it, quite a, a few um, businesses have started building because of these programs and that is the direction that we're not going to be able to solve all the problems overnight and that's just natural we're not going to be able to solve everything overnight but we continue to work we continue to provide the support where we can and we're going to look at how we can deal with the problem that exists now Well, the youth, count, the youth and sports councils in all the constituents, I think there are 19 of them. Um, I think most of them are made aware of um, what the government initiatives are, and they too have a responsibility to take this information and relate to other persons within their community. They, they serve almost like a, local, a component of local government where they're supposed to relay the information. Um, and as I said, they have a role to play. We cannot force them to do what they're supposed to do. Um, but we, even you look at the incentives, even in this year's budget, I think we would have even increased the allocation that um, youth and sports councils get. It may not be a significant increase, but we did increase. Um, we're increasing the allocation that youth and sports, and sports councils get in order to allow them to be able to um, extend their reach a bit and to, to do a little more than what they're doing now. Because they too play a very critical role. Um, I think once upon a time, youth and sports councils were very active. Now you see a little more dormancy in what happened, but they were very active and they play, they too play a very critical role in terms of crime fighting. And in terms of the, uh, the, the disabled, I know, Prime Minister said it's, it's, it's a special in the area that you know you could have something to do. So, um, what are some of the, you know, just not basically what, what are some of the people you know about traffic, you know, you know about accessing buildings? Okay, so um, I smile because you said the disabled, and, and I just like to be correct when we speak about persons with disability, and we appreciate when we use the language persons with disability, where you give person the person the prominence and not their disability. So in future, I would appreciate if we use this terminology, persons with disability. Um, <clears throat> but last time I spoke to the press, I informed you all that we were working, and I, I gave praise to the Taiwanese government for their assistance in terms of, um, they gave us some financial assistance, a grant that is, to help us build a national, disab a national disability policy. And I know that this morning the president was very happy and other persons within um, the community, the disability, persons with disability community, were very happy to hear that they're going to have a designated desk. And I think that that has been, that is a long time coming and that is very deserving. And I know that I said the community is very happy. We have quite a few issues um, as it relates to accessibility. Um, and it should not be a situation where someone who has a disability has to call on a particular person to give them access to somewhere. Little issues where you look at designated parking, whether St. Lucian's on their own, you go to Marcy, for instance. And I always give, um, I always thank Marcy for ensuring that they have designated parking areas for persons with disability. My issue is 99% of the time you go there, able-bodied individuals are there in the parking and they don't allow persons who really need the parking to park. And I think it requires us as a community, as a society, as a country, to truly do some introspection. Ask yourself whether or not, you know, you can just park on the other side where there's a parking and can walk to the supermarket and you're going to deny somebody an opportunity. And I can say this, and I get all emotional, that there are persons who've called me and who've gone to the supermarket and have had to go back because it was raining and they, could, they were not able to park in a parking that was designated for them because of an, if it was another person with a disability would have understood, but an able-bodied person would go park there. And then again, it goes back to the very fabric of our society, whether we respect rules and, and regulations in this country. And I think that's why it calls for um, deep introspection as a people that we need to start with these little things, respect these little things, and it's going to transcend into the bigger things. So, I'm happy that we're working on a national disability policy, to get back to your question. Um, I'm happy that the National Council for Persons with Disability um, have already reached out and, I, I'm, and I'm waiting to just familiarize myself with the various groups involved with um, 
persons with disability and see how we can get something more comprehensive so that even building codes and you have, there's a lot of, of legislation that needs to be enacted to ensure that persons with disability feel more included in the happenings of society. And just one last thing. I know it's only this thing, but in terms of persons with disability, with sports and recreation, it's part of the human nature. I'm happy that, that you actually brought that up because in the bigger picture, I mean, we need in creating a society that is inclusive, we cannot take away the social component and being an, or having a disability should not um, prevent somebody from being able to enjoy the daily things of life. So that is something that we're going to be looking into. We're going to start the discussion. Um, as I said, other persons have expressed their own concerns. On my end, even as parliamentary for Miku North in the new cemetery that I'm doing, one of um, the first things I asked those persons who were tasked with designing and preparing the plans for the cemetery was to ensure that the cemetery, every part of the cemetery, was 100% accessible um, for persons with disability, from wheelchair users and to ensure that we had the rooms the right places, to ensure that persons were not um, denied an opportunity to enjoy the everyday things of life, the good things that other persons are able to enjoy because he or she um, may have had a mishap and may have had a disability. Okay, thanks for uh, you spoke about your Okay, so the Miku Jetty, um, as we speak, on Saturday night, we had a meeting with the fishermen of Miku to discuss the general orientation of the jetty. We, we had a slight issue with the orientation of the jetty, especially the part that comes onto the shore. And we had a meeting with the fishermen to discuss the orientation and also to give them an insight into, um, just a little further insight into when we're going to start. The materials will be, all materials for the jetty have been received um, the cabinet conclusion has been prepared. The material should be cleared sometime during the course of today. And the contractor gave me a commencement date of first day of this week, hopefully once all goes well today. Um, but to be on the safe side, I'm, I'm going to say by next week, we should be able to have a ceremony and see physical works happening on the ground as it relates to the Miku Jetty. Ladies and gentlemen of the press, um, I'll take your questions right away. Cabinet meeting. Oh, okay. Well, as I, I guess I explained that already, but I'll do it again. The CELAC meeting was held in St. Vincent, and it was a meeting that saw the Prime Minister of St. Vincent demit office as president of the CELAC movement. They call him the pro tempore president. He was demitting office, and that was the first time that the OECS countries, an OECS country, was under the chairmanship of CELAC. First time. When he, he took over the, the chairmanship in Argentina, I did not travel, but I thought it was necessary to go to show our, first of all, our respect. Secondly, our, our support at the way the Honorable Ralph Gonzalez had managed the presidency of CELAC. And thirdly, to show our commitment to the issues that CELAC are bringing forward for us in the global world. The issues of climate change, the issues of citizen security, the, and the issues of a new model of financing for development. It was very important that St. Lucia showed its solidarity. And in my, in my address, I express these, 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 these thoughts. So I went to St. Vincent on the morning at 8 o'clock for the RSS jet. In there were presidents of most of the countries in Central America. The presidents were there. They were represented at the level of presidents. And the president of Honduras, who is the new president of CELAC, was also there. And she accepted the, the, the presidency of CELAC. As I went to St. Vincent on Friday morning, and I returned on Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock 
on RSS Jet. Okay, so you're back in St. Lucia, first business? And I'm back in St. Lucia, first since Sunday. After leaving the car and meeting, yes. Okay, I'm back in St. Lucia, first business, um, in the swinging um, of a new minister, and so on. This, the first, well, I'm very pleased and, and honored to, um, to have Honorable Jeremiah Norbert in my, in my cabinet. What happened, to, um, what happened this morning is, is the first time that a government is recognizing the role of people with disabilities in St. Lucia. It's the first time. What we're saying is that there are many people in the country who suffer from disabilities and they need a voice. They need a voice. They need a voice to see about their well-being, a voice to see about their, their facilities, a voice to see about their accessibility, a voice to see about the educational opportunities for themselves and for their children, an inclusive voice, a voice to get them included in society generally, because many people suffer from disabilities, and it's a whole spectrum. A lot of people believe disabilities only mean physical uh, uh, physical disabilities. That's not true. There are many, there are many people suffering from, from disabilities. And we saw it was necessary to have Honorable Norbert, who himself is an embodiment of what can happen to you with a, a physical disability. Norbert got an accident in the middle of a campaign and he had the grit, he had the tenacity, and of course he had the support to be able to get an election campaign and win a seat that had never been won by the St. Lucia Party in its history. So Jeremiah Norbert is an embodiment of what someone with a physical disability can do. And I'm very happy that he accepted my offer to sit in my cabinet. He's also the Minister of Crime Prevention. And you, and then the, again, it's something new. We're not reinventing the wheel here. There's also a Minister of Crime Prevention in, an, in another island in the region, other islands in the, in the region. And here's what it means, and I want to make it clear, he's not the Minister of National Security. I'm the Minister of National Security. But what the minister is tasked with, he's tasked with bringing together all the organizations, all the ideas, everybody who knows about crime suppression, he has to bring it together. And it's my hope that he can prepare a national plan, which will be in for tweeting and changing to deal with citizen security in the country. And his job is to bring all the parties together. Everyone who has an idea, everyone who has an opinion, everyone who knows what to do, there is a, a, a central body with a minister who was himself involved in law enforcement. Hopefully, and all the suggestions, all the ideas, all the methods, all the tactics that people think should happen, we can concentrate it on one man working with the Minister of National Security to see if we can get some level of crime reduction in the first case, suppression, and possibly prevention. And, th and, th and that is why I've appointed Jeremiah Norbert. Because of his experience, because he, he's a young person, he knows, he knows fully well the issues that, that young people face. He can, he's lived it. He's been a top cop for a short time in the police force. So he is, that's, that, that's his job. He's going to work very closely with me from my office. So he can put together all these plans. Because everyone has a plan. Everyone knows what we must do. To, 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 to reduce crime, everyone. So, Jeremiah, or with Jeremiah, no, but we'll speak to all these people and put these plans together, and hopefully we can get a comprehensive document that will see what are the steps. Albeit, it changes all the time. Albeit, crime or citizen security has been an issue in St. Lucia, but now we want to concentrate and zero it, and the Minister of National Security can have time to deal with the security aspects of the country, which is resourcing the, the, the police, um, finding the fiscal space to resource the police, and the police can deal with the operational matters. In the first place from the Minister's office, you indicated that German will be, will be representing um, Minister... The press well, never said so. What happened this morning is the Prime Minister said 
that Jeremiah Norbert will now, for the time being, hold on to the portfolios of the Honorable Virginia Port. That was only said this morning. That's never said before. The press release never said so. People assumed, and it's up to the press to assume, but it's never said before. Never said so. That was an assumption from the press and from other people who wanted to create mischief. She's improving. She's at home. She's improving. But I can't make any medical uh, pronouncement. As you know, I know you criticize me for that saying. I'll say it again. I'm not a doctor. I just said I'm not a doctor. And, and I'm going to continue saying that. Eh? So, all of the, so all of you who want to criticize me and say I'm not a policeman, I'll be saying it all the time. So they can as well stop that criticism. I'm not a policeman. All right? I say I'm not a doctor. Okay? But from, as far as I hear, and I'm very pleased that only the report is improving. But going back to the first release, it says that Honorable Jeremiah Norbert will adopt her ministerial Never said so. It said will adopt her. It never said it will be appointed a minister. My point is that she will over, he will oversee as, any, as a member of, as a member of parliament. He'll oversee the responsibility. He never said he'll be appointed a minister. Never said so. No, Anyhow, that, that's past. That, that's the past. Let's go to the future. The future is right now. He's been officially holding the duties of home affairs officially now. The rest was history. Yeah, but you made an initial statement that he did not need to resign for her for, for him to adopt her ministerial. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. I never... Listen, you see, you must make a difference what people say I see and what I see. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. You must make a difference what people say I see and what I actually said. You understand? When you must make a difference. And if you go back in the record, you'll find that I did not say that. But if, if I said it, I, you could go in the record, you'll find that I said it. What happens is that people are saying things... You know, there's a lot of noise around the place. And people are taking that noise as, as fact. You understand? If I said so, I will. I misspoke if I said so. I'm sure I didn't say it, but if I misspoke. But can, um, can somebody who was a deputy speaker, as you said, it says that he, he will adopt her ministerial responsibilities, right? But for one to become up to adopt or to look over, over or have oversight over, over the ministry, mustn't that person be, well, take a move? Look over doesn't make doesn't mean you anyhow. Listen to me. Let's just forget that. That's in the past. The fact is right now he is. You see, let me tell you what's important to me. What's important to me is issues that advance the the, the well being of the state. Right. Fact is the minister was unwell. Now, Jeremiah Norbert is now basically. The acting minister of home affairs, labor, and general affairs. That's what's important to me now. Okay. So, based on the explanation <coughs> of what he will be doing as the minister for crime prevention, mm -hmm. is the Ministry of Crime Prevention, is this a subdivision of national security mm -hmm. or no. is it a task force? It's it? neither. He is the minister for crime prevention and people with disabilities in the office of the Prime Minister, just like Richard Frederick is a minister with responsibility for crime prevention and people with disabilities. But, um, just now, crime prevention and persons with disabilities are new portfolios, right? Uh, new specific portfolios, yes. So will he be having a PS specific to that? No, he's going to work, he's, right now, he's going to be working in the office of in the office of the Prime Minister, and the PS, the Prime Minister's PS, will serve him for now in these two ministries. Yes, just, uh, just to um, kind of define that, you'll be doing a lot more field work, you'll be meeting a lot more people. You've defined it very well. I must applaud you for your definition. He will have a lot more time to deal with the issues as they come, as they arise. You see, because Norbert himself is a law enforcement officer. So listen to me. Everybody knows about how to stop guns. Everybody knows how to stop gun violence. Everybody knows everybody. Like everybody knows. So right now, you'll be able to have somebody you can tell all that and work together with him to curb this situation. Because if you know the answers, the Prime Minister sometimes may not have, enough, didn't have, may not have had enough time to deal with all these specific issues. So what he's done, he's divorced it from himself and he's given, it, he's given all these issues 
to a minister who is young, who is a law enforcement officer himself, and who has a disability. So his job, as I said to get to before, is to come up with a national plan based on consultation and based on dialogue with all these various groups who have answers, who have solutions, who have methods to suppress or prevent or reduce crime. This is his job. And we're not reinventing the wheel here. This has happened in other Caribbean countries. Okay, so within, within that wider outreach, you say it's a the youth will have somebody they can speak to. So then he I expect him to work with the NYC who have so, solutions, and some of them should not only be said on, on radio and television doing talk shows. Um so we have so you can come now to a direct link and deal with these issues. I just I'm glad you spoke about budget. And and my my good friend from um, um DBS, I want to show her a few things. You see? We came to Parliament with a World Bank thing, and the leader of the opposition made a big yawn cry. This and that. Was like, Do you know he's the one who signed for that loan? Uh, DBS. <laughs> the World Bank won $40 million. 2020. He was the one. So it's two components, the World Bank and the CDB. He's the one who signed for the World Bank loan. And, and here's what it's called. It's called... Listen, I want you to read it. You understand? Because... I want you to read for you because sometimes you hear these things and you take them as gospel. Okay? You want to read for you? You want to hear? Conditions for the loan. Conditions for the loan, right? I guess we need a separate press conference at you know. The statement is supposed to come but I just want to tell you that this loan, that that loan was signed, the the the, the, the DPL, the policy it's called the policy development loan. You understand? And it was signed by Okay. Over the medium term, the government intends to undertake reforms to improve efficiency in tax administration and enhance tax compliance. Listen. <laughs> These reforms include amendments to the postal income tax regime to reduce the number of deductions, simplify the process, and increase progress progressivity on the expenditures ex, on the expenditure side to prioritize expenditures projects and programs are being classified discretionary and non-discretionary and identified as financing being secured being not being secured or not or not secured um 
you understand? So I just want to tell you that these pre-existing things that 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 that, that we spoke of, all of them were agreed to and signed by the former prime minister, the former minister of finance. The, the policy-based loan of forty million dollars that we speak about. All right. So I'm just going to tell you that this that this loan was nothing new. It was something that um, that was that was signed by, it's a policy loan, a $40 million policy loan. He signed it in 25 years, right? He signed it, there. Yeah. So the, the uh, approval of the loan was prior to that or after that? He's, well, it, was, it came after he met the pre-existing conditions. Did he meet it? No, we had to meet, we, meet, we met it. But, but these are conditions that he set up. So that was a prior, you see, the way these things go, they are prior, they are prior conditions, right? The video is, is a document to the World Bank, and it's something that is a, a, a COVID, is a policy-based loan, policy-based loan. This is the same CDB link to the Right. Bank. One for the World Bank, one for CDB. There's two separate? Two separate loans, yeah. But it's, it's linked to something? No, it's the same loan. It's the same, it's the same package of financing that the World Bank to use. Okay. So is it the World Bank providing the... 40, and then the CDB providing the loan. Okay. I just want to tell you, there's nothing new. It was something that was signed before us. Yes. Budget. budget. The budget. Well, as you know, it comes in two in two 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 parts. There is the um, estimates of expenditure that's going to be laid the twenty the last week in March, the Tuesday, and then the debate happens on Wednesday and Thursday. Then after the reason why the debate happens on Wednesday and Thursday is the budget, the estimates which is the document that outlines government's proposed expenditure, is circulated before. So the opposition has time to study it. So the opposition is expected to respond the next day, and there are two days of debate, and then we go to the policy statement in April. Well, that, that, that will come in, in the policy debate. Um, the, the new projects and new plans will be outlined in the policy which happens in April. What I can tell you is that our country is on a good fiscal is on a good fiscal trajectory for the coming year. We had a pretty good year and we're going a good with very good um, understanding that we did in the f changing changing circumstances. Inflation is still very high. Um, we also have issues with the interest rates. Interest rates are, are climbing. The, the, these are the downside risks, and there is still a, a great dependence on tourism, but our tourism industry is performing well, but we have to understand these downside risks. Interest rates, um, inflation, and climate change. These are the three downside risks that, that we find. Um, you are the current company, you asked yes, um, yes. I know the opposition has a picture with your appearance on the opening ceremony. Where I was not there during the ceremony. Yes. Okay. Can I let me, let uh, let me give you my my flying agenda? As you know, the issues with regional transportation. I left Saint Lucia at ten thirty in the morning on Caribbean Airways. I arrived to Trinidad in Trinidad at eleven thirty. I left Trinidad at seven thirty. I got to Ghana. By the time I got to Ghana, the opening ceremony as was over. I got to my hotel room at 20 to 12. The Honorable Alpha Baptist was already in Trinidad, so he went to the opening ceremony. Okay, uh, coming out from that meeting, what are the big things coming out of the meeting? I know um, a number of conclusions that have been made. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the Caracom meeting, as I said, there's a lot of there's discussions on climate change. That's very important. That's in the in the in the upper echelons of the priorities of the government. The Haiti situation 
was there as Prime Minister Dr. Kenny Anthony. It's been a very important role as far as Haiti, Haiti is concerned. Um, the the CARICOM governments are very, very concerned about what's happening in, in Haiti. Um, as you know, the, situ the situation has deteriorated further um, this week. Of, in fact, yesterday, when 4,000 prisoners um, broke the prison, were, were, were made to flee from the prison. And this is a serious security problem. Um, we met face, we had a face-to-face -face discussion with President, Prime Minister um, Henry um, Ariel, Ariel Henry, um, and then he left the meeting to go to go to Kenya. I don't know where he is now, but the situation in Haiti is is the cause of great concern. That took a lot of that took a lot of time in in in, in our discussions. Also, woke up. World Cup is happening in June. There are some legislative situations that have to be put in place. As you know, the, the last time there was a World Cup, there was sunset legislation. That, that, that legislation has expired. This week, the Attorney General are going to meet at the end of the week to look at that unique legislation. Because as you know, the world has changed and security is of great concern to all, all, all the Caribbean countries. So that, that also came into for for discussion, um, so all in all, the then there was the the, the 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 caucus of leaders and the deep caucus of leaders where matters of national security, and also there was great concern on citizen security. It's a great concern. It's a great concern for all the for all the region, um, even at CELAC, citizen citizen security and climate change. These seem to be the the, the biggest the biggest factors obstructing the growth of these islands, citizen security, and, and that is why the national government found it, import, found it important to have a designated minister to deal with that issue. It's a great concern, a serious concern for the region, not only in the Caribbean. And that doesn't make any excuse for us, but it's something that we have to face head on. And that's why we're calling on all, all of us, everybody, because there can be no winners there can be no winners when citizen security is compromised. There can be no winners. What's the original approach yes, to that, though, the security? What was the Again, you see, different, <coughs> different, there's one general consensus, the illegal importation of guns. Guns, 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 guns. That's the, that is what everybody agrees on, that there are too many guns that come into the region. Too many guns. Secondly, gang warfare. So we have to find out why are young people attracted to gangs and gang warfare? Now, it's, there's, a, there's a feeling that crime has become a public health issue. Because there are lot, something we do not consider is when there is a shooting, the effect it has on the public health system, on the physical public health system, when somebody gets shot, when somebody gets shot, what happens? When you go to the hospital, a whole, the trauma that, that, that it causes. So no one, and this is why sometimes it, it, it amazes me how in St. Lucia, people pretend that the, the, the prime minister should have an answer. If the prime minister said he had an answer and he did not implement that answer, the prime minister would be responsible. Why would a prime minister want a country where there is wanton, wanton criminality. No prime minister would, would want that. I don't think the former prime minister wants that, wanted that. I don't think the next prime minister will want that. So it's manifestly unfair to pretend that we have all the solutions and the solutions are, and, and solutions are happening because the prime minister is not affecting them. It's, it's unfair and it's not right. And it borders on dishonesty. I've made it clear that I have given the police all the operation, operational space that they need to implement the policy of the government, which is to reduce crime. They have all the space that they need. And we give them all the resources we can. You're going to hear in this, in this, in this policy statement, they, they're going to be given more resources to, to, to combat crime. So we are genuinely concerned we want to see an abatement, and we're doing what we can do within the circumstances. 
So I just want to, to assure the public that this prime minister and this government is focused to causing a reduction in crime in this country, particularly gun-related offenses. And we have appointed a minister to work with all the parties, to work with the political parties, if they intend to, if they want to, to work with him so he, they have a direct link in the cabinet through the Minister of Crime Prevention. All the bodies to come together, let us work to solving or helping to solve or helping to suppress, helping to reduce and ultimately helping to prevent crime and improve citizen security. <coughs> I really wanted to say that. Uh, and we're very happy about it. I mean, it, it's delightful. And, you know, it comes to the things young people are doing. Young people are doing marvelous things in the country, you know, but we're not, we're not promoting it. I'm elated with, with Julian, Alfred, Julian Alfred's performance, elated. She, I mean, she is, we're waiting for the day when she'll get Olympic gold. This is going to be the day we're waiting for. We have to work towards it. We have to encourage her to do the work, to do what she has to put in the effort. And the government will give her all the support that she needs. And we've been, we've been doing very well for sports this year. Very well. And next month, next, next week, the Professional Football League is starting. So the, the government has been advancing. You're going to see repairs on, 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 the, on the playing fields. So the fact is, the government is very, very supportive of sports. The government hails the achievements of Julian Alfred, and the government will continue to work with her. And if all other budding sportsmen and women, to, for them to reach their highest potential. So, um, so would you say that um, Julian's um, performance can, is, a, is a shining light, it's a beacon of hope for younger people, you know, that see this young It is. Really, it is. And there are many other sportsmen and sportsmen, sportswomen who are out there who we have to encourage. You see, my job is to encourage. You know, I saw something on social media, some facts that body brought it to my attention, where people were trying to politicize the situation. We can't politicize sports. We can't politicize crime either. These things are not... We have to go beyond that. We have to rise beyond... That there are certain things that we have to get together as a country about. There's no, sh there's no we can't look for the short term gain of who supports who or who did. We have to, we have to forget that. These things are national things. This country doesn't belong to any politician. This country belongs to the people of Saint Lucia, particularly the young people of Saint Lucia. We have to take some things away from from the partisan politics. You have to take it away. And, and then, even at the expense of being called weak, or at the expense of, 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 of being misquoted, I say there are certain things that you must take away from the political situation. Crime. Sports. Take it away. There is no benefit when there, is, there are more murders under one government and then one, one, and then. there's no benefit absolutely no benefit you may get short term votes but it doesn't it doesn't benefit you because you seen you remain with the problem and this is why i'm saying we want to put concentrate these things onto one person with the help of the cabinet and reporting directly to the prime minister in mission national security thank you yes the who Oh, the Minister of Tourism is holding, continues to hold discussions with, with, with them. As you know, that development will transform, if it happens or when it happens, will transform that east coast of the country. Um, it's a, it's a, it's what, it was it was it's called a challenge property. It has to be, you know, it's development started there. And it's it, it got aborted for some reason. But the minister is in constant discussion with him. But. We're going to be having a series of new investments, the Minister of Tourism Investment will tell you about. A series of new investments will start in this country shortly, including housing. And I want to see the, the year of infrastructure also means housing, roads, public sector buildings. You're going to be, get, we're going to be 
um, be, be starting or continuing, starting the House of Justice. We're going to be doing an addition to the the Grosley Police Station, the Northern Headquarters. The second phase is going to start shortly. Right now, is the first phase is the is the administrative block. The second phase is going to be the accommodation block. That's happening. So, infrastructure will, will encompass all these all these elements. 